Okay, so. Oh, yeah. Hi. Hi. Hi, everybody. I'm waiting to see if we're live. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> this is fast. Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Facebook Live. I'm Mitzi Soretto, and I'm here um, to talk about my new book release, The Best New True Crime Stories, Small Towns. And I am being joined in <laughs> by contributors, contributors with an S, C.L. Raven, who are joining us from Wales. Yay! Hi. Hello. Nasta. Good evening. <laughs> um, first off, do you want to just introduce yourselves so that people realize we've got two people for the price of one, so to speak? <laughs> just like our poor mum. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Lynx. So I'm the L Raven. And um, I'm Kat. So I'm the C Raven. Oh, um, yeah. You know, how come I didn't figure that out? <laughs> <laughs> Well, see, yeah, our, our, our actual surname is Davis, just like everybody else in Wales. So we were like, we need a new name. <laughs> hang on, hang on. I thought it's Jones. Everyone's Jones. Yeah, it, it's like Jones, Davis, and Evans. And like, so about, I think 50% of our friends are also Davis, and we're related to none of them. <laughs> It's just, it's very confusing. <laughs> oh, well, hey, listen, it's like it, the telephone book must be quite boring. It's like <laughs> 100 pages for Davis, 100 yep. pages for Jones. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> hey, but you, you've, you've got the market cornered on really awesome first names. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Davith and... and <laughs> Uh, so anyways, you're here to talk about, uh, you wrote a very interesting story for the book called About a Boy. Yes. I, I keep thinking of the of, of the film by that name. This is know, sort of... We're, we're really bad at titles for our stuff, so we just either use film title names or song title names. There's quite a few um, of our stories that are named after Metallica songs and My Chemical Romance songs that we just... As you go through our like CD albums, <laughs> pinch their titles. Well, I mean, this is this is a sort of a fitting title about a boy, but it's a quite a twisted boy compared to uh, <laughs> the one we might be familiar with on the screen. Yeah. Um, uh, so why don't you uh, start off? Tell us a bit about the small town in which this takes place, uh, Abertillery, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, Abertillery is a, uh, a it's a mining town in the valleys, and um, it's a lot it's of a typical mining town that you find sort of all over Wales, really. Mm -hmm. uh, South Wales was sort of basically built by the the coal mines, and so a lot of South Wales is, um, especially up in the valleys, is just filled with uh, little mining towns, and that's basically how everyone um, uh, made their money. Our, our family were were all miners, coal miners, and tin plate workers. And, that, and I think that's why we're so short, is that we, we were destined to be down the mines as well, because every now our family is really short. <laughs> then it closed uh, in the decade we were born, so like, I think we missed an, uh, an opportunity of, a, of a, like a steady career. <laughs> because um, there is a mine that's still open, um, Big Pit, and... I've with, been there. Uh, yeah, we we don't have to duck. We're the only ones that can walk around the entire mine completely upright <laughs> as in children anyway. That's just, I felt like Groucho Marx in that pit. You know what, he, he sort of like walks with his legs all bent with a cigar. I just yeah. was like, yeah, my back was killing me when I left it. I'm not tall by any means. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we, we just drove through, had hats on, completely comfortable height for us. <laughs> So um, Abertillery was, it started off quite as a small town, but then when um, the mining industry sort of came to it, it, it grew uh, quite a bit and became then one of the largest towns in the valleys, didn't it? And yeah, so it's sort of typical of a small Welsh town where everyone knows each other and and it's just like a really, just sort of like nice places, aren't they? Like. Yeah, everyone's sort of really friendly. I mean, people in Wales are generally friendly anyway, but sort of, yeah, it is just an ordinary town. Um, it's about 
what 45 minutes from us yeah so ah uh, so so it's sort of nearby then did, did that have any did that have any bearing that it was nearby that uh, sort of inspired you to perhaps uh, take on this case uh sort of and also because we this, we don't get a lot of murderers in Wales, yeah, and like, yeah. especially not. I think we've only got one serial killer. Now he was in North Wales, so for like serial killers, murder wise, Wales doesn't have a lot. Um, I mean, it's quite a small population. It's only about three million people in the entirety of Wales. So it's the case is unusual because of that. Because we don't have mass murderers generally, or serial killers, or anything like that so it, he stands out yeah doesn't he? is uh so the most the in england and so i think he is probably the maybe not only but he's definitely the well the the most known welsh murderer because it just you know so unheard of yeah even yeah. today it's just even today something like that happening in in the Welsh town in the valleys would still be shocking. Yeah, well, I mean, the story is shocking um, if whether it's in Wales or, or pretty much, you know, even even in the notoriously murderous United States, it would be a bit of a shocker. And, and there's not a lot here that it, that's shocking anymore. Um, <laughs> Um, now, the, the story, before we talk a bit about the story itself and about the uh, the, the uh, killer, Harold Jones, uh, when when did all this take place? When This is set in the early part of the 20th century, correct? Yeah, it was in um, 1920 it happened, which again is significant because that's the date our grandpa was born. Yeah. So it's still like, um, he died a few years ago, but so it's still quite in living memory for a lot of people. Um, I think he was convicted in 1921, but, you know, 1920, it was, um, obviously life was very different then. And it, it's strange because uh, the photos you see of him, he's in like a three-piece suit and he's got a pocket watch and a, a flat cap. And that's not, that's just not how you imagine teenage murderers to dress. And so yeah. it, it, and it, it's strange. Um, that is like how they used to dress. Um, our grandpa there's photos of him on the beach in his suit so everyone was always like really smartly turned out so yeah 1921 is still you, you'll probably if you go to Abertilio today you'll you'll find descendants of the people who were around at the time because small communities like that you, people don't tend to move away from them so there might even still be people who are alive who who remember it, so which I, I suppose makes it sort of significant as well. That it it will still be sort of present in that town now. Yeah, it's almost probably, yeah, like a be, stigma. Almost. I mean, would you would you feel that in a way that, that it's it's like the stain that never quite washes out? Yeah, basically, I think pretty much everyone in the town would um, know someone who. But, you know who knew him or who knew the victims um like their parents or grandparents and they would still um i think it would still be quite sort of painful for them because it's you know people that who who live that you know they don't tend to to migrate out so and also because they were so convinced it was like a stranger because that didn't happen in the town. And the fact that he was one of them and obviously his family um, were living here for a while and his age as well. So that would that would still be sort of felt through the town that it was one of them that did it. It wasn't some passing stranger who, who murdered the girl. No, somebody that the entire town liked and trusted. Yeah, yeah. Well, that that's the scary part, which um, we'll get to a bit later about that that whole disbelief. But uh, without giving everything away, although we have to give something away, um, tell us a bit about uh, Harold Jones and and the crimes that he committed, so people get an idea. Um, Harold Jones was um, he worked in a grain store uh, not far from his home. Most of us. Yeah, um, Mortimer's Green Greenstone, and he was fifteen, and um, he was 
uh, convicted of murder, but because of his age, he was he was too young to hang. Um, it was, I think, it was, had the trial gone on, he pleaded guilty because had the, he gone to trial, by the time the trial ended, he would have been sixteen and of legal age to be hanged. So he wanted to plead not guilty throughout, but when he realised that if he was found guilty, he would hang, he he changed his plea. Yeah, so basically so that the trial would be concluded before his 16th birthday. Yeah, well, he, he was hedging his bets, obviously, because I, I, I think initially you have where the judge even advised him, hang on a minute, maybe you'd better think twice before you put in your plea because going to trial is going to be a totally different thing. Yeah, and like the whole town was fully supportive of him, completely convinced he was innocent. You know, now they were it's, really angry that yeah, he was arrested. Yeah, they would camp outside the police station because they were so enraged that, that the police arrested this boy and the, the police had to send them away. And even after he was charged, they still did not believe it. And um, when in the first case he was found not guilty, they actually uh, threw a parade for him. They gifted not a hero's well. He did, and he got he was gifted the gold pocket watch by the town. And what was worse was he was like congratulated for getting. Um, off by a man who, yeah the second girl's father yeah and so the, the second girl's father you know actually said to him you know we didn't think you'd done it well you know well done welcome home and then uh, his daughter was later murdered by Harold so that sort of that makes it worse yeah yeah, well, I mean, this is this is just um, this particular kind of the the crimes that he committed. These are not just killings. I mean, these these are pretty nasty crimes. I mean, tell us a bit about that. Now, he actually uh, had a victim total of two, right? And these are little girls. These are yeah, um, Frida and Florence, and yeah, Frida's death certificate had said um, that the cause of death was shock from rape or attempted rape. Um, injuries to the vulva and hymen, injuries to the neck and partial strangulation, injuries to the forehead and um, nervous shock and fright. So basically it seems that he tr he tried to rape them. Um, she was only eight. I, th I think she was eight. Yeah, yeah. She, was she was only eight and um, she'd come to his store to buy grain for the chickens and he said, oh, we don't have any here, it's in the shed. So took her to the shed and then tried to rape her and she screamed. So he strangled her and he hit her over the head. And what sort of makes it worse is that people heard the scream and one boy, uh, one young man actually put his ear to the shed thinking, did they hear a scream? Didn't hear anything else? So went away. And then he later had a mental breakdown, possibly caused by the fact of he could have saved her because she was alive for a couple of hours afterwards. And um, but he just he didn't hear anything else, so thought nothing of it. And yeah, she was still alive at that point. Well, I mean, you you don't know. I mean, a child scream. You know, you always hear children screaming. Yeah. You know, it's who would who would think it was a murder, especially at that time period and in that kind of environment. It's the last yeah, thing. Yeah, and, and in that town where murders just didn't happen, it you know it wouldn't, it wouldn't be the forefront of their mind that there's yeah. a child in trouble because it was a, it was a relatively crime free place, and I think one of the other neighbors thought it was like the chickens and I mean chickens are loud they scream so yeah the, it wouldn't have been in their minds a child is in trouble it just it wouldn't have occurred to them at all yeah exactly exactly um 
So, so um, th there's there's definitely there were two two victims here, and um, and and it wasn't even just um, like he attempted to rape, and then maybe there was a fight, and you know the child fought back and he killed. But I mean, he actually um, was very calculated in in what he did and yeah. disposing of the body. Correct? Yeah, and um, even like the first one. Um, he, he put her in a sack and he moved her to the alleyway and then he took his friends back to the grain shed saying he'd forgotten to lock it. So he actually took his friends to the crime scene and then they went through the alley and he saw the sack and kicked it. And they, they, his friends did not know that at that time the little girl's body was in that sack. So he was being quite brazen about it, really. Yeah, he was... It, he was quite arrogant for you know a murderer but also for one so young to be so much in control of himself that he could go back to the crime scene and his friends didn't suspect anything and and to be so uh, brazen as to take his friends to where her body was and this, like the second one he hid her in the attic of his house and it's like and then her her mother was it came to call to see if she was there and he said oh she had been but she went out the back and he had just killed her at that point and but, yeah he'd just finished washing the blood off his hands and then just was able to convince her mother that that she'd like been there but gone away again and that second victim was playing with Harold's sister, they were friends, but the second girl, Florence, um, did like call out to Harold after he got out from court saying, oh, you, you know, we know you did it. So she openly accused him of uh, Frieda's murder. So then I think when he, he had the opportunity, then he killed Florence and um. Again, like you know, she knew him because she was friends with his little sister, and it was in the fact that he like tried to deny it, even though he'd put her body up in the attic of their home. And his dad said to him, "Well, it was either me or you, and I know it wasn't me." And then I just dragged him back to the police. Yeah, I mean, this this certainly puts paid to that notion of the so-called innocence of children, although I don't really think a 15-year-old is a child, but then perhaps in the 1920s, you're talking about a different mindset with a 15-year-old. Yeah. But I mean, yeah. this is really sophisticated, you know, I mean, this, this is, is, that's what makes it so extraordinary. Yeah, the, because obviously, yeah, 15-year-olds in, in the 1920s, they were practically adults. But yeah, to have that level of control, considering he wasn't an experienced murderer, it was, you know, he, he only killed the, the, the two girls, but he had so much confidence. And yeah, because they were basically crimes of opportunity. Yeah. He didn't have time to carefully plan either of them. It was just he found himself alone with the victims and and killed them and yet still managed to be really composed afterwards that it, it didn't seem to be any sign of panic or anything like that and his employer and his employer's family gave him an alibi for the first one <laughs> they said oh no he was definitely in the shop we heard him in the shop and because they were so convinced that he was innocent that um that they gave him an alibi and then after Florence was murdered and he was actually convicted, the Mortimers ended up having to sell up and move out of the town because they they partially blamed the family for Florence's death because had they not provided Harold with an alibi, Florence may well have still been alive. So they did end up having to actually leave the town because they were just not wanted there anymore. Although Howard's family stuck around. Yes. <laughs> because That's a surprise. I would have thought back. they would have been the first ones to leave. <laughs> yeah. But he would, um, when he was uh, eventually released, he would go back to his family's home. So he would go back to the, the town where everybody hated him. 
so even then that that's quite an, an arrogance yeah yeah that, that's pretty that's pretty beyond cheeky i mean it, it sounds like there was never any sense of remorse either i mean uh even though he he served times so to speak time for someone who was you know not quite legal age it's not really hardcore time i don't think uh i mean if i'm correct it was like a, he, he didn't go to like a regular prison did he um well there weren't a lot of prisons in wales no. um so uh, he, I think he ended up in an English prison, didn't he? Oh, okay. It? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think, was it Wandsworth? Because the, the um, yeah, there, there's only a few prisons in Wales, and especially at that time, there wouldn't have been a lot. So I think he did actually end up in a... Yeah, Wandsworth in London it was. Yeah, so he ended up in an English prison. Um, and at that time, a lot of Welsh people couldn't speak English, so that would have been quite difficult because um in english would not have been uh, his first language yeah he might not have been, he might not have spoken any english actually um in, in those times a lot of uh the last times he doesn't actually speak english so prison would have been probably quite difficult for him but yes it, yeah, they weren't really... He didn't get into trouble in prison. No, there, there wasn't much about his uh, his prison life. He he was released and, and then joined the, the Merchant Navy. But, yeah, he seemed to behave himself. Um, obviously, there was no chance for uh, murdering uh, girls in, in prison. But, yeah, there, there was... Not much, there wasn't any information about it. Like, no. He was obviously he obviously didn't make a, a mark on the system because. But then he read about it. Uh, he was likable, you know. The whole town liked him. The whole town believed his, his innocence, and that. So I imagine that he was probably quite liked and popular in prison as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, one of the things that struck me most about uh, the story and how significant it is with this whole small town ideal and, and, you know, the fact that, you know, we know our people and we're all great. And we all stick together is how they rallied around him and, and after the first murder and, and did not believe it. Uh, I mean, it was didn't they even like have like a parade for him? Yeah, yeah. He, he was basically given um, he was wrapped. Welcome. They nearly stormed the police station to get him out. Yeah, they. Um, his parents took him to a restaurant. He stood up in the restaurant and gave a speech thanking the town for their support. He had to stand in ovation. They they hired a um, a shower bank, which was a horse drawn carriage for him. And yeah, they presented him with this gold pocket watch. And yeah, so he was basically treated as a hero it almost seemed that the the townspeople were more angry or about his arrest than about the murder because yeah they were more outraged that one of their own was arrested than they were that one of their own was murdered but it was it was weird yeah that the, the, they had such strong conviction in his innocence that it didn't even cross their mind. So actually, he might be guilty. Of just know this, it wouldn't be one of us. It, it's not him. You're, he, you're he wrong. Joined in on the search party for the second girl. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. I mean, this is this is just be. This is so so far beyond his age. Uh, yeah. You know what what you would assume. I mean, this is like uh, the kind of calculation, uh, calculating, and and uh, lack of empathy that you see with serial killers. Which, yeah. it's, which we'll get to in a minute. But I mean, if Harold hadn't have been caught after the second killing, it seems to me this would have continued as a career of killing little girls. Yeah, and he it's not like he had, you know, nowadays, obviously we've got true crime documentaries, true crime books and, you know, loads of TV series about, you know, like CSI and that, but he would have had nothing like that to help him or inspire him. And so it is, he showed quite like sort of advanced thinking really, you know, the fact that he joined in on um, the search party for Florence, even though he knew exactly where her body was because it was in his house. 
and that's really cold and especially because you know he was so popular and liked in the town he doesn't show any signs of that like psychopathy that he displays when he kills the girls and then helps people to look for them because um his teachers all like him he had a lot of friends he wasn't a typical serial killer you know he didn't kill animals he didn't wet the bed he didn't start fires he was basically a model the model child yeah and then he yeah the fact that he you know he worked in the stores to to help his parents out financially as well so on on the surface he just seems like um like like a decent boy but he wasn't yeah yeah clear clearly not clearly not um now he how long do you do you happen to know offhand how how long he served in his prison term um 20 years oh okay okay so it was pretty substantial yeah yeah he, it's, yeah, it's, it's not like the thing was released yeah, because I mean, today's society now, if, if you're 15 and you commit a crime or whatever, they sort of put you in a young offenders or a juvenile facility and then they let you out later. I mean, one of the cases that has really annoyed me and pissed me off a lot is, is the Bulger case. Oh, um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> which is a prime example of, of this sort of thing, just to just to give a weep cap if people don't know. Um, uh, it was a uh, a ten year old boy. Uh, two, wait, hang on. It was two ten year old boys, right? And they uh, kidnapped from a shopping center a little two year old, and they murdered him and they dismembered him. And uh, they basically, uh, what they served a few years, they were let out and they have new yeah, identities. Yeah, yeah. The government um, gave them new well, identities. One of them is back inside. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. Um, they found. Um, he was found to be in possession of uh, indecent child images that put well, back inside. And yeah. You know, there's, just, there's some, you know, I think there's just some lines that you cross that, that um, I don't think there's coming back from that. And, and this, <laughs> this is one of them. And, and then the fact that the British government just gives them a new identity as well. Yeah, like, the, the it's Bulger, okay. Yeah. The James Bulger case was huge because um, especially we were um we were 10 at the time so we were the same age as the two uh murderers and so yes yeah, so it's like that's going back nearly 30 years yeah and it it, it was huge because at that point people like well, children just don't kill children they don't and the fact that you know they they lured him away so they obviously had some sort of plan and they they lured him away to the train tracks and i think um they threw stones at him they threw blue paint at him they shoved batteries in him and it was it was brutal they, they beat him i think with bricks and you know it was so brutal and horrific and people couldn't believe that two you know two kids could do that um the one of them was a typical troublemaker delinquent didn't go to school sort of from a broken home and he's the one that is now back inside where was the other one after he was released obviously they gave him a new identity and um he has apparently just he's faded into a sort of non-existence really he's just got on with his life and um he hasn't like committed any he just lives an ordinary life now whereas yeah um i think he was led by the other boy yeah um, so he hasn't done anything since and he sort of he was a model prisoner inside really but yeah i think if people find out their identities they'd they kill them you know, 30 years later if if people found out you know where they were and who and who they are now i i think they'd still probably but they, they would be mob justice done because um they you know they didn't serve long enough and people um i don't think we'll ever forget that case and they'll never forgive them for it and 
And I think it was made worse by the fact that they were so young because obviously there's, you know, there are a lot of, you know, child murders in Britain. You know, you've got um, like Myra Hindley and you've got um, the the two little girls that were murdered by the Ian school, Huntley. Yeah, Ian Huntley, the school caretaker who murdered two little girls. And whilst they're hated, it's not the same sort of venomous hatred as um, the um Robert Thompson and John Venables got for killing James Bolger I think because they were so young so yeah it, it was huge you know we even now like um people you know remember their their faces the school photos that were used like all over the newspapers and that it's still very much in people's memory and that I think then that's kind of like the same of what happened with Harold Jones is that it's still very much in people's memory. Yeah, yeah. Well, which brings me to um, Harold Jones and uh, the fact that um, you've created an interesting uh, tie-in with Harold many, many, many years on when he's in his, I believe, late 50s, 60s, um, and uh, he ended up in London. Um, and, and you've linked him with some potential serial killings in London that were never solved and I believe are still not Solved. Yeah, yeah the, the Jack the Stripper case, yeah, it was, a, um, we found someone who, who'd, uh, I can't remember which website it was off the top of my head, but we, we had found someone who, who sort of suspected because he lived on the same street as one of the victims and where he lived was central to the other victims and um they found metal filings on the bodies and he worked in um like a sheet workplace wasn't that yeah so the yeah the, the the metal filings came from i don't know if it was his exact place of work but it was from so, his industry from, from the industry he worked in and and yeah and the fact he lived on on the same street as the victims but he'd changed his name so the police didn't know who he was so I don't think he was ever questioned about it. He didn't change his name like greatly. It was just Harry Jones. No, Harry Stevens he was. Yeah. And but when he was dying, he told his wife, oh, no, I want to be buried as Harold Jones. And um, cause he, he'd got married and he had a daughter and they, <laughs> they had no idea who he was or that he'd been in prison for for murder because he was. As an adult, he was a sort of quiet, well-liked man who just, you know, typical family man. He worked, didn't cause any trouble. So, again, he was really well-liked. And But, yeah, was it six murders of prostitutes? And, mm. and um, you know, and it was in his area. And, yeah, and his job connected him to them and I think they sort of did they question his neighbour? I can't remember but um yeah he was never sort of a suspect in that because nobody had looked into his background and he didn't know that, that there was a murderer living on that street and so yeah, and, and the um, the women were killed in the because he disappeared for about three years, and the women were killed in that period when his whereabouts. Yeah, there was an identical picture that kind of looked like him. Yeah. Well, I mean, you certainly, in, in the story about a boy, you certainly create a, a, a compelling argument that it that it could be him. Because, I mean, if you think about it, if, if somebody started out that young committing these kind of crimes, and they're, they are sex crimes as well, and brutal crimes, um, how can you, I, I can't see you're stopping cold turkey. And, and I'm sure he got, he did not get any kind of intensive therapy and, you know, no. from psychiatrists or... no. And he would have just been let out and I doubt they would have kept, you know, nowadays, like obviously you have like parole officers and that to keep an eye on prisoners, but it, that wouldn't have been the case back then. And 
obviously he was released and then lived in London, so nobody knew him. And he was very good at making himself invisible and not noticed. And so, yeah, if you, he, it was during the time where he vanished for a bit. They, and so the victims, they all lived relatively near him. And yeah, the metal filings again, like, think, yeah, it was, it was pink, it was. And I was just, I was just double checking. Yeah, so uh, yeah, he was a sheet metal worker, and there was the same industrial paint that was found on uh, the last four victims. And then, of course, he dies then in his sixties. And after he dies, of course, no one else is murdered. So yeah, that's that's another kind of a little clue there. That yeah. suddenly, oh, suddenly, no more killing. <laughs> Coincidence. <laughs> yeah. Oh dear. Well, it's it's a fascinating story and um, certainly uh, gives you a, a slightly different impression of of Wales, which is like uh, I was saying to somebody the other week. It's not just coal mines and Tom Jones. <laughs> <laughs> we sleep too. <laughs> and mountains. <laughs> oh uh, well, I, I was also going to mention that. Um, uh, how's your mom? She's fine. Yeah, yeah, she's really good. She's uh, she's been enjoying lockdown. Oh, <laughs> she, she, she retired. Um, it was a year ago at the beginning of the month, but she was doing some adult tutoring part time. So lockdown has really been like a proper retirement for her because <laughs> she she, ha she hasn't been able to do her uh, tutoring. Um, she does childcare tutoring. She she was a teacher. And um, she does a really like practical stuff which you can't do online. So lockdown has actually been more of a retirement for her than her actual retirement. Well, well, for for those who don't know, uh, who's our mum? Hi, mum. Hi. <laughs> yeah, you. Yes, you've actually uh, played a part in this book because uh, the book's been produced for audio. Uh, Podium Audio did a wonderful uh, audio version, and we needed Welsh pronunciations because, oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, the, well, the production company's in Los Angeles, and and I don't think they had any, any random Welsh speakers running around. So <laughs> your your and mom girls, here did the some recording. <laughs> So we had these uh, MP3 files being sent to me with all the pronunciations. I forwarded them over to Podium. <laughs> so I think they did it okay. <laughs> yeah, but, um, we, we have a speech impediment. So uh, and like in Welsh, so we, we can't pronounce the letter R. So we, which is uh, quite detrimental in Welsh because. Uh, <laughs> They're all about rolling their ass and we can't even say it. So. Oh, it's a challenging language. I mean, um, yeah, definitely. I, I, <laughs> I have <laughs> seven vowels. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's kind of like if you were to hold up a book to a mirror and so everything's like kind of like backwards and doesn't look right, that's kind of what reading Welsh is like oh, Lovecraft, the Le Le Lovecraftian language of Cthulhu and that, that that's sort of quite based on Welsh although we do still find it weird when we drive in England and they just have one language on their signs the signs yeah. are, their road signs are so small yeah. you've just got like 20 road signs and it's just one town name in one language and we're like and the town is not like 25, 30 letters long yeah, <laughs> it's, it's so weird and it's just so even now in England, you're like, this, this isn't right. Yeah, well, I remember driving around Wales and I'm like, oh, it's over by the, 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 the town. You know, it's like, I'm not even going to try that, you know. It's like, you have to try to try to keep that in your mind that that's what you're looking for. I mean, it's just, oh. Yeah. But I miss, it, I miss it. Wales is wonderful. I, I should have moved there. And hey, maybe I still might if, if we ever survive this uh, COVID <laughs> nice. crap. It's a better country than England. We have a dragon on our flag. <laughs> yes, you've got a very nice flag. I really like your flag. It I don't know. I've had great experiences in Wales. I think it's it's a beautiful place, and and uh, Teddy, my famous bear, is 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 quite enamored of Wales as well. So there you go. Has he visited the uh, the longest town name? Uh, what, what is the longest town name? Oh, it's a Samfaya Pukring or Go Gareth Rindrob or Santa Sinia Go Go Go. Oh, yeah, we know that. No, I don't. I think we missed that one. 
we, we all just call it Samvaya. <laughs> like, gosh. Oh, no, no, but he did go down the big pit. Uh, we we love we do love big pets. Um, <laughs> we took our friend there last year for, uh, for her like birthday day out. <laughs> it's always really cold up there and it's always raining. Did she thank you for the for the severe backache afterward? <laughs> <laughs> She's a shorty like us, so she was okay. <laughs> oh our dear! Friends in our group though, who was a lot taller than us, I don't think she was as grateful. <laughs> <laughs> Oh dear! And when we went to that uh, uh, the the famous slate place, what's it, Fastiniog, or what's it called? Uh, yeah, Blind Fastiniog. Yeah, 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 whatever. <laughs> That's an interesting place. <laughs> it is. <laughs> oh well. Um. So we will be wrapping up, but I wanted to ask you: Are you um working on anything new or something you'd like to tell us about? Get in um, a plug. We haven't done a lot of um. A lot of writing recently because since April I've been having constant migraines, so mm. I haven't been able to even look at a laptop because the moment I'd like switch it on and start working, it would just trigger an instant migraine. But then somebody told us about night light and setting, so I've put a night light on, so our screen is now orange, and so that's okay. So it's like got a weird orange light on our screen. So I can I can work with that, but. Um, we just had a story accepted for a charity anthology. Yeah, but, um, um, just at the yeah, that you wrote longhand on paper. Yeah, I had to write it <laughs> to go back to using a pen and paper to write oh. it because I could not use the laptop. And then I was like having to like count all my words like just by hand, so that was a pain. And then um, we had the poem accepted in a different um, anthology for. Uh, a care home, um, the the guy who's organising it who works for a care home, we actually ghost wrote a novel for him a couple of years ago. And um, we're aiming to bring out a book of ours in hopefully by April. We, were, we wanted to do it by Halloween, but because I haven't been able to work, that's sort of not really happening, but it's an epistolary book sort of set during the Victorian times about um, a cursed castle. So we had the story accepted for uh, Gothic Blue Book oh, by uh, Burial Day Books. But yeah, on the writing front, we haven't done a lot, but um, also because we opened a, a mobile poetry studio seven weeks before lockdown <laughs> in the worst time in the history of setting up a business. And um, we also started a Poland aerial fitness magazine because there isn't one in the UK so we've been sort of doing that well I've sort of she's been, been doing that I've been doing the magazine <laughs> and the teaching so it hasn't left well I'm lying on the set to eating popcorn and with my uh, <laughs> trusty lavender wrap which is like never far away from me because this is the only thing that like even remotely helps yes yeah, so I haven't had the uh, much time for uh doing actually any writing uh because of doing the magazine and, and teaching so, so we thought oh lockdown will finally like get started on some no like novels we've been meaning to write it's not a novel but then the migraines hit so yeah so we got to chapter five yeah and i abandoned it then I'm like, i can't work <laughs> no it's always something isn't it i feel like you know i i've got all these projects that i'm trying to juggle and then things just keep popping up and a lot of it's business related you know business related to the books because there's just so much to do it's not just getting yeah, the book out but it's all this stuff that goes with it and upcoming yeah, stuff and formatting is always the worst and oh, ten. yeah we're, we're really bad to like the moment this, this is storm <laughs> oh, oh, is this the, is this the kitty that ruined your laptops? No, no, this is a good kitty. <laughs> no, that's a nice kitty. I hate the kitty. It's a dog as well. Um, oh, okay. Who's the what's the, who's the doggy? What's the doggy's name? Uh, Bandit. Bandit. Oh, yeah. He, he's got an eye mask. Yeah, um, like, can see. So see, he's got he's got like a little. Oh eye yeah. And. Uh, oh. <laughs> Gee, that, we found the whole family on today. <laughs> I know. A small portion of the animal army. There's another 20 around somewhere. Yes, I've seen your pictures of the, this. Uh, is it hamsters, is it? Some hamsters? Yeah, our lockdown has been spent taking in pet, other people's pets that have needed a home. So beginning of lockdown, we took in another snake. And then oh. 
two months ago where we took in four degus. We had no idea what a degu even was, but we ended up with four of them. And then a few weeks ago, we ended up with four hamsters. That was our sister's fault because she'd gone to a pet shop and someone had surrendered a, a litter of hamsters that were like a year old. And then our sister um, was like, oh, but, you know, I had some, like, cages. And they were our cages. She stole our hamster cages and then filled them with hamsters and didn't give us any hamsters. And so then she was like, oh, I've got – I went back. So she went back and then adopted the other hamsters. So she brought home nine hamsters. <laughs> she deliberately chose the day that we were that we were teaching so we couldn't go because – we were like, no, we want to go because she won't give us the hamsters. But she, she and we were like, and it's only uh, on a Monday we we teach out of um, a hall and we're pretty much there all day. So she chose the Monday to go and get the hamsters, and we thought sure that was deliberate. So she, she takes all the pretty ones and all the tame ones, and we've got the ones that all look the same and they're bitey. <laughs> It sounds like you're going to need a bigger house soon. Yeah. <laughs> or just keep adding on additions, you know. Yeah, we, we took on um two baby guinea pigs as well because someone we know um she went away for the weekend, so we volunteered to to look after her pets and we kind of stole her guinea pigs because <laughs> they were like left out like in all weathers and it's like gone completely feral and we were like it's not how how piggy piggies need to feel safe. They need warmth. Yeah. They need a specific diet. So we we eventually managed. I spent like hours like crouched in a blackberry bush waiting for the guinea pigs. And then eventually caught them. And uh, so they they live with us now as well. well she's waiting, she's waiting, yeah, she's waiting to get a hutch for them to have them back. But like we've already named them. Yeah, we, she named one Trump. And we're like, we can't, we can't have that. Let's just never mind that they're in all weathers and not having a proper diet. She, she named them Trump. It's just cruel. Yeah, that's crossing the line. Yeah. <laughs> we renamed them. And we've within four days, we tamed them. Yeah. And they've had a bath and they've had the groom and a haircut because they were long haired piggies as well. So they're quite matted. So they're like living a, the life of luxury now. They've now oh. learned sing for their supper because they're in the same room as the daegus the hamsters and two other guinea pigs so they all now so we've, we've got like a full chorus going on the daegu thing too so you know that's how it should be we need to look after our our animal friends you know yeah they deserve the best <laughs> yeah people people are yeah you know yeah people, i think everyone knows my opinion on that but <laughs> animals yeah they are they're the best yeah <laughs> so, well, listen, thank you so much for joining us um, again to to listeners and viewers and listeners. Hopefully you're doing both at the same time. <laughs> I've been speaking with CL Raven, which is Catherine and Lindsay Raven, and uh, they wrote about a boy for the best new true crime stories, small towns. So it thanks so much for being here. To, like, go up and actually visit the town and then lockdown happened and uh, they cut all travel restrictions. So ah. We can't go, but we do need to actually go because a lot of the town is unchanged. So the areas where sort of things happened are still pretty much the same. So we do want to actually go and uh, visit take the book with us. Yeah, and take the book with us. Um, uh, a woman we know is from there. And so she said she'd take us on the tour there. So oh. uh, which would be good. That'd be interesting. Well, I mean, I think your story is, is respectful of, of everything there. I mean, I don't, you know, I mean, obviously the one thing with true crime is you, there are people that still have these memories or are still alive and, you know, you have to have some sensitivity, but I think that, you know, you've done that with a story and uh, there's nothing there that would, other than what's fact. Yeah, because um, we read, the, um, it was a local author who'd written a book about the case and he actually raised money to have proper gravestones put on the girls' graves because the families couldn't afford gravestones. So he actually um, paid for um, proper memorials on the girls' graves. And because like he'd, he'd spoken to sort of everyone and like had kind of become part of the town, mm. didn't he? So it's like sort of 
even now there's um you know there's still that community there yeah 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 well that'd be interesting to visit all these things that you've actually read about yeah i wrote about rather <laughs> sorry Brains well, sort of yeah, we up. have read, we've only read about them as well. So. Yeah, yeah, read, read about and written about exactly, exactly. Um, well, thank you again, um, CL Raven. Oh, thank you for having us on. As new true crime stories, small towns, and listen, take care, and uh, see you again sometime. Bye. Bye. Bye.